for me, I think I built my confidence from my internship with IBM. Even though it, I didn't start well, at the end of the day, I look back. If those things didn't happen, I don't think I would have learned certain skills that I could ask questions. I should come out of my comfort zone. I would learn as I, you know, as I go, you know, uh, without putting just my eye on the ball. That I need to learn this. I need to learn this. I need to do this. So that's what I would say to that. I welcome Juanita de Sousa Hueletti as the sixth guest of my It's Possible series as part of Canada's Career Month. Juanita is a member of the Board of Governors of the University of Manitoba. She's an accomplished and dynamic IT management professional with over 30 years of industry experience, over 25 in leadership positions most notably being the first female divisional head of the IT division at Winnipeg Police Service. Juanita plays an active role within her community and industry, serving on several committees and boards at the executive and advisory level. In our conversation, Juanita will share her remarkable story of first coming to Canada and how this experience has influenced her career journey. She will talk about being a female STEM leader and the career advice she has for younger professionals. She will also share more of her tips regarding working and successfully immigrating to a foreign country. Hello, Juanita. Welcome to the show today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> and I'm so appreciative to have you here today because I, you know, I did research about you and there is, you know, so many great insights and experiences you have had. And I really would like to have our viewers, our listeners, especially young professionals and people who are working related to career development to hear your insights because I feel there's just so many best practices to learn from you. Thank you very much, Karen. Yes, I'm always willing to share my experience and make a difference. So I do this voluntarily and I'm happy to be on your platform, both on YouTube and LinkedIn. And we apologize for the technical difficulties to start this with. Yes, and, and I'm very appreciative that, you know, we get the chance to talk <laughs> to each other live right now. And yeah. now there might be people listening to us today who do not know you. And so I have asked all of my um, It's Possible series guests to introduce themselves with five facts according to the Working Out Loud methods. If you could please do that. Thank you, I will. So I'm Juanita de Souza Hulete. I'm married, career woman in STEM with three adult sons. Uh, I'm a dynamic information technology management professional with over 30 years of industry experience, over 25 years in leadership position, most notably being the first female head of the IT department of the Winnipeg Police Service, a founding member of Women in Cybersecurity Western Canada affiliate, and I'm also on numerous board um, um, and most recently appointed to the University of Manitoba Board of Governors. I'm also an educator at Red River and University of Winnipeg. Um, I love to cook, dance, entertain family and friends, as well as immigrants who have nowhere to go during Christmas and other holidays like Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm originally from Ghana, and um, but I was born in Lome, Togo. Um, one of the things um, I want to share, which, you know, is that I need to start working 100% on my passion of helping and empowering the voiceless, especially new immigrants and women. But somehow opportunities keep presenting itself and I get pulled into the unfulfilling, hostile male environment. But I'm really working on it. And um, as I'm approaching retirement, I would love to work for another five or so years. So God willing, with good health, I may be able to start working on my passion. Um, the other thing I want to say, uh, as Canada is now my new home, is that I feel blessed to call Canada my home. 
um, as I've, I've made great friends over the years. Um, yes, there are challenges, um, but staying positive and focused uh, is the way to go. Um, there are people who will respect you um, for who you are and what you bring to the table. I consider myself as one of the success stories as an immigrant from Ghana and proud to call Canada my home and living the Canadian dream as this is where I started my own family with my husband, Emmanuel Hunlite, and I'm grateful for all the opportunities and challenges. Actually, now, 31 years and counting, I've spent more years or time in Canada than I have in Ghana. Uh, many thanks to the amazing friends and mentors that welcomed me to their homes and cottages and also gave me, provided me professional opportunities over the years. Thank you so much for sharing, Juanita. And, you know, as you just said, you've been living in Canada for 31 years. And so originally you came to Canada to do an internship at IBM. And so I'm curious for people listening who are at the beginning of their career. So when you first came to Canada, what did you anticipate your career to be? And, you know, what happened and why did certain things you know happen or changes that you might have not anticipated initially well there's a lot about me that i never anticipated but i will i'll start by giving a little bit of background about how i came and things i experienced because that would give people you know um the quiet Juanita, why you know yeah so you're taking me back to 31 years ago you know uh, and to give you a little history about my arrival in Winnipeg before jumping into the anticipated career path, as I'm sure the immigrant that are within your audience and on your different platforms can relate to that. So for me, I was a novice. I came right after university. I've always been sheltered. I had just finished my first degree in com in, with double honors in computer science and economics um, in August. Actually, the first female to graduate with that combination. And then October 6th, 1990, I was in Winnipeg, Canada. I even missed my graduation. Proud to that, I've never really traveled outside Africa, been to other neighboring countries like Togo. Um, but I've never taken a plane. I've never left home. I'm always surrounded by my family, especially my siblings. So it was a total difference for me, different experience. Unfortunately, when I landed at the Winnipeg airport, due to flight delay, my sponsors who were supposed to meet me at the airport had left. Uh, my mode of communication at that time with my sponsors was using Telegram. There were no cell phones. <laughs> I mean, if they were, they were very limited. And I only had their office number, so I could not reach them. So I was stranded. Luckily for me, I met someone who became my roommate, Andrea Morris, who was working at Avis Rent the Car, um, who is now my best friend. Um, so, she took me to a hotel nearby. And then the next day, um, she came for me to join her family for Thanksgiving dinner. The food was different for me. I've never eaten broccoli in my life, yellow corn and non-spicy food. I was hungry, so I ate a little, um, but that was not the type of food I'm used to, but I was grateful for that. Well, as I indicated earlier, I arrived on a Thanksgiving weekend. So the Monday was the working day, and up until the Sunday after the dinner, I haven't had any correspondence with my uh, sponsors. So my newfound friend, Andrea, took me around and showed me the bus route that I need to take. I've never taken a bus before, nor understand the bus system, nor to, how to read a map. Um, so what happened? I got lost. Uh, thankfully, she gave me some extra bus ticket and gave me her phone number to call her. Again, there were no cell phones. I called her. She wasn't at home. So what will shy, not confident Juanita from Ghana, who have just landed, never been outside the house, do? I started talking to strangers to get directions to my workplace, which was written on a piece of paper. Well, thankfully, being in friendly Manitoba, I did, I did get the needed help and made it to work. And it was really cold for me. Anyway, I met my sponsors and, you know, work looked very different to me than expected as well. It was, I was, we were on the seventh floor on a 25 plus story TD building. It was huge. It was amazing. The environment was very welcoming. 
Um, I've never seen anything like that in my life until I came here. My boss at IBM, very generous guy, Rick Peters, showed me around as I intern and introduced me to two other co-ops from the University of Manitoba that I'll be working with and one other casual one. We were, our role was called the marketing assistant because we helped the salespeople set up and tear down computers for demos, training and presentation, as well responsible for the IBM television private network. I realized I have to learn very quickly because all the technology was completely, completely um, new to me. Yes, I did computer science, but we have four people sharing one computer during our computer lab session, which was the hands-on once a week. So it was very limited and much of it was more programming. So I know it's part of the theory, but I never had a hands-on experience. So that was a challenge. My second challenge was I like typing skills as everything I did in Ghana was handwritten. I've never owned or had a computer to use myself. Here I am in a dedicated, with a dedicated computer. I have to learn to use it, send email and messages, print labels. But thankfully, my new fan roommate uh, had a typewriter. And so I was able to practice that during the evenings. And my boss also gave me a typing tutor. Within a week, I was able to type the characters and I was able to communicate and proactively use the computer effectively. My other challenge, as I said, was the technical know-how. Setting up the different computer system, and not only one kind, different kinds, um, and be able to connect different cables to it, the mainframe system, the, uh, the PCs, the AS400, um, was very daunting for me. Uh, Windows was not in the pipeline. IBM had its own operating system, the UNIS. Um, so it was our responsibility to ensure the hardware and the software are properly set up and installed and everything is working for training and the demo. So it was really, really a challenge because I was thinking, oh my God, what did I get myself into? How am I supposed to learn all this thing? Yes, it was a big challenge. This is not the time to cry, but figure out how I can quickly learn what I need to learn to be effective. So I turned to my role model, my lifetime mentor, my lifetime, my lifeline, my dad. He has just retired as the chief technical officer at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. He guided me and provided me direction on what I need to do, laboring cables, putting them in my drawers. Um, and then he told me, ask lots of questions. You have nothing to lose, ask questions. So I started asking questions. And in no time, I was able to set up a complete thing very successfully within the first month that I was there, that my boss was quite impressed and gave me two tickets to go watch the Jets game, which I did go, although I didn't know anything about hockey. So as you can see, uh, it was like a roller coaster, nothing that I, have, uh, and I anticipated, but I focused on the ultimate goal. In fact, I never anticipated coming here in the first place to start with. You know, as when I was done school, you know, um, one of the things is um, I was supposed to be a teaching assistant for both economics or computer science. So a uh, program before this came up. So I learned, this helped me to learn to grow, right? Um, and, the, and, 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 and one of the key thing is that I never took my eye off the, the, the ball. You know, I was very proactive and look at the challenge as an opportunity. I was brave. I wasn't afraid to ask questions. Um, I asked for help. So in terms of what I anticipated after my internship, I would say that nothing in my life had been anticipated because everything, everything turns into something I don't imagine. I never thought of even um, uh, being here is one thing. So I actually terminated my internship much earlier than planned so I could go back to school because my internship was supposed to end in March and I wanted to start school in January. So that was what I did. So having worked at a prestigious organization at IBM, I thought it would be easy to get a job and support myself while in school. But that did not come easy either. Unlike today, where students are allowed to work anywhere in Canada or within the province for 20 hours, during our time, you can only work on campus. You can't work anywhere else. So that was very limiting. But based on my experience at IBM, that helped me. I was able to go door knocking, getting out of my comfort zone, seeking support, 
you know, going to the International Center for Student, going to different institutions within the university and looking for, and seeking for job opportunity. So I eventually landed a program advisor job with the computer services department. In the summer, I also did some research. And again, my first experience with IBM, I believe, gave me the confidence to keep striving for more and, and looking for more opportunities. So as you can see, <laughs> my anticipation of events are quite different from what happened. And I was no longer the shy girl that I was. You know, I have to survive and, and, and deal with situation. And that's basically how I found myself. <laughs> Wow. wow, Juanita, Juanita your, story your story is, is amazing. amazing. <laughs> and I feel for, you know, people, especially at the beginning of their career, listening to this and realizing that things might not fall into place as anticipated. But you know what, as you are demonstrating, one can make the best out of every situation. And I'm sure that in the beginning, you looked back to the start of your arrival in Canada and how you survived this and how many positive things came out of it, as you said about exactly. your friend and, you know, and then going forward starting at university trying to find a job i mean i i'm just amazed and so like you know for somebody who is contemplating maybe one day to go to a foreign country if you had to sort of you know give them sort of five you know skills you feel have taught you from going to Sorry. a foreign country Sorry, I'm just trying to get the light out of my way. Yeah, okay, yeah. Now it's, go. that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Light is gone. <laughs> um, well, as I mentioned earlier, um, I never really thought of moving or settling in another country right after completing my university degree without, you know, even graduating. Um, I had always longed and dreamed of and anxiously anticipated my graduation ceremony and having my proud parents and siblings around me. But everything changed when I got the internship with IBM, which was an opportunity I can't pass by. So, um, like I said before, I had the University of Ghana, where I attended, also gave me two positions to be a teaching assistant for either economics or computer science. I was going to pick one. And usually when you finish that, you know, you get scholarship to go to UK or the US to continue um, your, your, your education. Um, so coming to a new country that I call home now, based on my experience and that of my son, my, actually my oldest son relocated to UK. So it was it's easy for me to relate to some of his challenges and opportunities as well. So as I've indicated in the previous qu uh, question, I, you know, providing background to some of the responses, you know, so in this question, I'm just going to be more specific. Uh, and not drill down into some of the um, um, examples. So much depends, I would say much depends on uh, if you are moving to a different country as a professional or a student or internship and what your plans are after that. Do you plan to go back home? I had planned to go back home. I never planned to stay, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> And I've been assisting and sharing my experiences at different platforms to also help others. So the first thing I would say is do your research on where you are going. Um, you know, the country, the province, the city, the town, you know, on everything possible, culture, climate, important dates, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, go make Google your partner or a friend. That's what I would say. Also, connect with your community. As today, information is on the internet. So I know if, uh, you know, one of my high school, after 28 years, the niece was coming. He Googled my name, found that I was in the same province as the, uh, the niece was coming to, so we're able to connect. So that was another way of connecting with people that you may not have heard from. You may see them, you know, being in the new country that you want to call home or want to re relocate to. Um, for students, and, 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 you know, for students or even people in an internship, if you can have a, um, a homestay or hostel, I think that's very important because it's, uh, it speeds up your integration assimilation process, uh, at least for your first year, because it gets you 
to be with people who are already established so they are readily available to answer your questions instead of you trying to figure it out um ensure you have enough money to cover any emergencies in my case you saw that i was stranded at the airport i have to go to a hotel thank god my brother gave me some money which really helped me other than that i would have been really stranded um and the other big thing i always tell people is don't make any assumptions without proven facts right don't just say oh i think there will be this i think no you it has to be proven okay and i'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um in my own personal experience um be willing to learn be willing to learn grow and open to change at all levels be it the food the games the climbing the people you have to learn right and adapt um it's always great to plan uh, as a project money i always encourage people to plan um but but be prepared for the unknowns in my case as you can see and that <laughs> things will change on the fly and if you need to learn to adapt to the changes and embrace it with positive attitude there is nothing that will move you forward okay um and be prepared to get out of your comfort zone which was something i tried it was tough. I was like, did I just talk to those people? <laughs> you know, people who know me in high school would tell you oh, Juanita was quiet, shy, bookworm. But now when you tell oh, Juanita used to be quiet, they will go, oh, oh, I know people. When my brother comes and visit in, in Winnipeg, they say, no, you tell me she wasn't quiet. And my brother will go, no, she was. <laughs> uh, you know, be prepared to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, zone. Um, have an open mind and not be judgmental of situation or events. Um, and be socially and culturally aware on the do's and don'ts, right? Uh, and, be, and, and be conscious about culture differ differences and the culture clash it. Because sometimes that pushes people to go back uh, to their comfort zone and, and, and not aid in their successful in integration. So that's very important. And don't, and don't get disconnected from your new home. You know, you don't like hockey, you don't like this. Find something that you like and mingle with people and enjoy it. The other big thing I see with us immigrants, you know, we come and we are in our communities or we go somewhere, there's somebody from our community. Meanwhile, majority of the people there are not from there and there's only one or two people and you start speaking your language. Please stop it. Avoid that as much as you can because it's, it's, it's not respectful to, for the audience. If much majority of the audience are your community people, yes, feel free. But if it's just one or two and you just start making those conversations, sometimes they may feel you are talking about them. So be cautious about that. Be open to educate people in your culture as well. I find that very helpful. And again, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, uh, and integration through network, community, career, lunch on, trade shows, you know, and, and the desire to adapt and learn and have the growth miles, mindset and then willingness to learn new things. Uh, these are some of the things I would was, I, I was say, uh, some of the advice I would give people who are thinking of relocating or making Canada or somewhere else, um, you know, um, uh, a new home. Yeah. And in terms of career wise, be prepared for anything. Uh, I wasn't fixed on one thing. I wasn't. I was just hoping for opportunities, and I turn my challenges into opportunities, embracing anything that comes its way. The other big thing is volunteering, in is key in all activities. Um, even at work, they have different committees: United Way, whatever it is, at church, whatever I volunteer. And if you have kids, you need to volunteer in your kids' activities. That's what I did. I dropped everything and I participated, whether I know something or not, my youngest played hockey, I knew nothing about hockey, I was in the change room, I would ask some of the parents to help me tie his skate, I don't know what to buy for him, I talk to people to tell me what he needs, uh, so um, like I said, it's much of it is about integration and getting involved. This is so wonderful, Juanita, thank you, it's, you know, I find it, you know, when you were mentioning also, you know, engaging with people from many different communities. And it's like I've lived in, you know, a couple of uh, four countries total. And I can so appreciate it because it allows one to really get in, you know, 
a, a broader community from people living in the country as mm -hmm. well as international um, people. So I thank you very much for sharing all of these great tips. And mm -hmm. now we've talked before and you have mentioned that you have had your career in many different areas. And so again, for people who might initially think that a career is more or less like, you know, sort of a stepladder in, in one industry. As you have had experiences in so many different industries, what do you feel, what tips can you give to young professionals, like transferable skills maybe that you have learned in one industry that you could apply to another or other tips starting in a different industry or moving sideways that that will be wonderful yes like i stated earlier i came here for internship with ibm and even at the university i uh, in addition to working um at the computer services i was doing a lot of research in different areas even in department of engineering the, you know human ecology um i believe the my experience at ibm helped me develop confidence in myself, know that I can learn anything uh, that I set my mind to, um, learn the art of asking questions and asking for help and support. So I believe these skills really helped me in school and future careers, as I was not afraid to deal with difficult situation and be uncomfortable and be in an uncomfortable situation. I just got to know more about people and not to be judgmental as well. So, uh, you know, after grad school, I did a lot of work there. Um, I worked for um, employment project for women. You know, I was um, I was a program officer there. I worked for International Institute for Sustainable Development. That has nothing to do with IT. It's my economics background that I used there. I was a program officer um, there developing indication. It's all about the growth mindset. Then I was at the city of Winnipeg, where I assumed three leadership positions. I went there as an economist. So my first year, I determined what they want me to do to develop this forecasting model. It's not going to work. So I told them it's not going to work. And again, that the confidence I have is like, you know what, just say it. What's the worst case scenario? So my job actually was deleted. But then my boss realized I have a lot of potential. So there was a position in another area where supervisor for IT, because when I came, I did some IT stuff for them. So he said, no, you should apply for that. You should take that position. So I did. And because I was already internal, you know, it was a supervisor for the IT environment. And I've never really supervised anybody or have any leadership skills. So my boss for that position um, said, yeah, you have a degree, you have your master's, but, you know, you don't have supervisory skills. So, you know, this requires leadership skills. Um, so I said, well, Yes, I don't have it. And I believe that's why we have probations. And I can't go to school and learn leadership. I can read about it and have some of the tips, but to, to really be good at it, you have to learn from your mistake and experience it. So I said, I can't really go to school, but I believe we, I have six months probation. So I'm telling you after two months, if you feel I'm not meeting your expectation, you can fire me. That boss today is my friend and my mentor. And even you see, sometimes you comment on my LinkedIn stuff. So that's how it was. And they gave me that opportunity just because I said, he said I, he was quite impressed with my response that, yeah, I don't have it. I'm willing to learn. Uh, give me that chance. You, we have six months, but I'm giving you two months. And I wouldn't be that confident if I wasn't able to do the things I did during my internship uh, with IBM, right? So um, it's very, very important. And, and there I did a lot of, um, um, you know, project management came to me naturally uh, as I was at ISD, we're managing a lot of uh, international projects and stuff like that. So I had an interest um, um, for that. So when my boss realized I have that skill set, I managed some of the key projects for that department. Uh, one of which I'm still always proud of is the first property, uh, property assessment uh, website where customers can go and that actually uh, help them and they saved a lot of money because the appeal levels went down again. So, um, and being the first, you know, female and black to take on management and executive leadership responsible for all the te technological needs for the Winnipeg Police Service, I think have given me um, 
a lot of um you know space to to look at things in different ways one thing it taught me is to be ethical and state and stay and stay with the truth irrespective of the consequences even if it might mean standing all by myself um it also taught me and my family resilient perseverant and persistent it was i would say in my words it was very hostile toxic male environment but i i i i i, I at the same time i met a lot of good mentors and female strong women that i will call friends today I volunteered at my boys school. I was the chair at United Way. I was able to, you know, see some of the good work that all the 100 plus charitable organizations that they support. I was involved in my community African Pavilion. I was one of the founding members of African Pavilion. I myself and my family, you know, worked there, assisted uh, uh, with stage management, dancing, whatever they needed. I mean, anything I'm involved in, I volunteer. I'm curious. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to know more. So again, um, I would say, you know, the skills you learn in everything you do, be it volunteer. For me, I think I build my confidence from my internship with IBM. Even though it, I didn't start well, at the end of the day, I look back. If those things didn't happen, I don't think I would have learned certain skills that I could ask questions. I should come out of my comfort zone. I will learn as I, you know, as I go, you know, uh, without putting just my eye on the ball. I need to learn this. I need to learn this. I need to do this. So that's what I will say to that. Wow, it, it's you know, it's just such a wonderful reflection on your, you know, career life. And I feel sometimes people might say, "quote unquote," I have only have had an internship as my first and only practical um, work experience. But hearing you that you draw many decades later, some of the skills and the confidence you said to, you know, to back to this internship, I feel really should give people listening to us early in their career, you know, the confidence to say, okay, I've had this experience and i can draw from this and move forward building back on that so that's that's really wonderful mm -hmm. and um the one thing you were just referring to being in a stem environment um as a woman and so i'm curious like for somebody who is um listening to us a, you know a, a female professional thinking how can i you know, go into a STEM profession or what would you say and, you know, what mm -hmm. support could you give them to, you know, encourage people to do that? Well, that's one, uh, this is one of my favorite question. Um, like I always say in my opening, it's unfortunate, but the needle has not moved much as we approach 2022. That female professional, especially in leadership roles, still face a lot of challenges and barriers every day in every corner in the world, on their professional front, in STEM and beyond. We all have stories to tell uh, for being the only woman or among very few women. Yes, there have been some progress, but not enough to get us out of that hole, especially women in STEM field. I emphasize every time that women are needed for businesses, organizations, institutions to be successful. And we've seen that with the organization that have a lot of women or proportionate number of women in leadership position. You know, we've heard also the notion that, well, women lack confidence. And for some of us, they tell us we are overconfident. So we can win, right? So what I say is I completely disagree with that notion because I feel women are more emotionally strong, more compassionate, more empathetic, much better in management and organization, consistent, more disciplined, and far better in conflict resolution than men do. We, be, we being women are capable of seeing all shades of life. We have an inborn instant to deal with all crap that we face every day because we are, we are the homemakers. We are the mothers who carry our children in our wounds and go through intensive labor equivalent to the pain of 216 bulls being broken altogether. 
we balance work and home responsibility in a neat fashion. And when female leadership deals with strong women, they feel insecure and get intimidated. So they will say and do whatever they can to bring us down. And I'm here, I'm not going to be one of those stereotypes. For years, we know companies, universities, they've done lots of research, you know, why women are less likely to enter STEM fields and why once they enter, especially in leadership, they face challenges and frequently are pushed out, right? And many studies have also found that, you know, women leave STEM fields in droves. 52% of highly qualified women working for science, technology, engineering, and companies leave their jobs. 52. We and others have found that the culture surrounding women in STEM have been shown time and again to be particularly challenging. It is challenging. Yet many other women have also managed to build highly successful careers. And for some, we do to prove ourselves. What are some of the things? These are my opening statement, right? You know, how do we define success, right? There's no straightforward answer in defining success, especially for women in STEM. Is it the satisfaction of the job, respect from, for your expertise, or a senior level position? To me, this varies, and it, de it depends on each individual desires and aspiration. Here are some items that I think work for most women that I know where some of them are my mentors and for myself. You need to be your, your authentic self and not be intimidated by bullying tactics. And don't be a checkbox where you are checking a box, oh yeah, they have a woman in leadership, but you have no influence, you have no power, they don't allow you to make any decision for change, for the betterment of others. You need to remain passionate about what's important to you. Why are you in that role? If I take a position, I'm in there to make a difference. I'm not there occupying a seat, especially for STEM careers, okay? We need to be willing to share our ideas in platforms like this and for other like-minded women and girls to get out of that thinking, right? You know, sometimes people think, oh, you need to bend over backwards to fit in the workplace culture. But as a woman in STEM, I believe to bring authentic self to work. This is who I am. This is what I do. I get things done. Can you challenge me on that? No. Get out of my face. <laughs> okay? We also need to explore opportunities outside our comfort zone and opportunities that will challenge us. We need to move, 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 move. Don't get you know, comfortable, okay, I'm manager, so that's good, you know, I'm good now. No, that's not enough. Keep moving, don't be static. You know, other women and girls are watching you. They need to learn from you. If they know you have made a change, they will feel, okay, she did it, I could do it. So going to police as the first black and female, I was cautioned by so many, including my Canadian maid friends, Juanita, are you sure you want to get there? Well, guess what? Whatever they cautioned me about, yes, it came to light, right? But it was a great learning experience for me. I have to make sacrifices for my family and, and my family was behind me 100%. I have to prove myself. I thought I have to prove myself. That being done, I'm being stoned from all corners. I have to put in three times the time required of me. Is that fair? No. Okay, so we need to get out of because even though some is oh it was a negative experience to me it was positive because I learned so much from there that I'm able to share with others as well mistakes I made as well. Okay, so confidence, like I said before, is key um, for STEM women because if they know you won't take the bullshit, they won't bring it to you. <laughs> but if they know you take it, they will come after you. And I got that confidence, like I said, early at IBM. Okay? So you, you have to define what your success is. I can't define that for you. You know, you need to build the confidence and you to reinforce that notion. The other big thing that I think women of STEM, we lack, I wouldn't say we lack it, but, you know, support system. You know, we need to be more open about the support we need to succeed in our career without feeling being blamed or ashamed or something of that sort. 
and how that can be tailored. And that is tailored to each individual situation and circumstances. Ask for help if you need it. It's sometimes daunting, especially in our STEM careers, you know, uh, professional environment to be asking, oh, you know, I have to stay home today, so can you take my shift, you know, doctors, or oh, I need to take my son is sick, so I need to work from home. It's like, okay, it's going to be used against you, so what do you do? They have used something like that against me. I didn't get a raise, and I didn't get to apply for a promotion in one of the jobs, places I went, because I went on maternity leave. So there was one year loss, so I couldn't get a raise, and I didn't get... Um, and I didn't get to apply. I have to wait for six months before I can apply for any job that comes up internally for promotion, right? People ask me, how did you do it raising three boys under six at a point in my life, working full time and attempting to finish my coursework for my PhD program? Well, I realized I was being stupid, so I dropped my PhD and focused on my family and my work. Remember, what may work for me may not work for you. So you need to reflect on your needs, what you think will work for you, right? So for me, I had a dynamic husband that if I needed help when I was doing those, I have to talk to him and both together we set expectation on the role of the chose in the house and parenting and stepping in if for some reason I have to stay out at work. And those conversations should happen early on, not later on when you are in it before you have those conversations. Having a mentor is important. I mean, I cannot re-emphasize that enough. So, you know, um, I never had a female mentor to start with. My dad was my mentor, but now I have a number of female, you know, mentors um, that have aspired to admire and just listening to their stories, how they made it really inspires me to keep doing what I'm doing, okay? So it's also good to share your experiences. And then the other key thing is networking. Quite often, we women, career women um, or mothers, will go, well, we don't have time. Weekends, I have to take my kids for activities. And most of the networking events are in the evenings or weekends. But you need to invest in your peer networking activities. I sometimes call that self-care. That's the time you connect with people, talk about your language without any intimidation or anything. You know, and building those relationships is very important. And that increases trust. You know, listening to other stories, you go, mm, so I'm not alone. It happens to so, so, and so. So, um, so you need to make time for it. Prepare your 30 seconds or one minute elevator uh, pitch to sell yourself. Right? Men are able to sell at themselves. But when we are selling ourselves, they will tell us we are boasting. No. Always have business cards. You know, update your LinkedIn profile, which I'm bad with, by the way. So <laughs> I've been updated it for a while now. Invest time in understanding your work environment. And that's something I've learned now. You know, it's not about the big money. It's not about the title. It's about the, the environment that will complement me. And people go, well, am I going to know that when I don't even work there? Well, you can tell, you know. Uh, how they embrace di diversified workforce, how they support women, by just looking how many of their leadership they are female. Is the only one, two? I've been places where I'm the only one or two, and then the other 14 are men. And sometimes when there is five women, only two are there for the right reason. The other three are on the pedestal or there for reasons they have no influence, um, they have no um, uh, no influence. They, they are not making any effective change. They are not having any constructive conversations about women in STEM to change the environment. So you know, it's 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 they are not looking at other women and trying to promote them. So we need to invest um, and and look at the work environment where we work. It's not just about the money, but again, everybody's situation is different. It's not about the title, okay. And also prioritize what's important to you. I decided to drop out of my PhD program and focus only on my work and my boys because that's part of my integration. Because as my boys started soccer, everything, I was involved. My husband was involved. Whether I know what I'm doing or not, I'm there to learn. I don't have to know it, but I know I can ask questions and I know I can learn. You know, the other big thing, and I was also a victim of that, is we don't take credit of our work or ideas. 
when I left one institution, a friend of mine came, he said, you did all this. Why didn't you put your name on it? I was like, I don't know. Right. So, and, and this is alarming because 82% and women are like that. We always, you know, put our achievement under and let the big guys take credit for it, you know, and in recent studies, they say 82% of women in STEM say their contributions have been ignored, overlooked or undermined. You know, we hear how, you know, uh, we, they've been victims um of women being spoken over or even robbed of their ideas or their work you know however feeling on head or can you know and this is very um distressing and can be disengaging but the response the the, the report also indicates that three out of ten women are the only ones who speak up when these things happen why are we not saying anything about it it's time for us to speak up when we feel we are overlooked or somebody is taking work. There is no time for me to share my personal experience in this platform of intimidate. These are intimidating tactics against you, right? But this needs to stop. You need to confront such situation quickly and tactfully. If you brought an idea at a meeting, I've been there when you know somebody else brings it, I will say it, and then they will twist it. I'll go, oh, that was what I just brought at the last minute. And anyway, I can add more items to it. So this is what I'm thinking. So I take over. They don't like that. They will try and shut you down. But I find every way to let them know that was my idea that he's bringing. And now it's a great idea. When I brought it, they overlooked it. Okay. Don't be muted. And that's why I talk. You know, and it took me a while to come out of my, you know, <laughs> you know, but don't be muted. Speak up. Um, and it's important to, sh to ensure you're adding your voice to the conversation and making sure your voice and opinion is being heard. Uh, you need to be assertive, even if you are the only one standing in the room. The other big thing is breaking the stereotype rules. I like everywhere I go, I have pen and paper. I'm always writing. My staff will go, you don't need to write this. So what happens to us everywhere we go, okay, we need to take notes. It got to a point, I was like, nope. I brought pen and paper. Yeah, you want a pen? I will give it to you. You want a paper? I'm not taking those. Right? We need to break those barriers. The fact that I have pen and paper doesn't make me your secretary. I'll give you the pen and paper to write it. Be, a, be proactive and be, build a strong profile and opportunities for yourself. Think about yourself. You know, boasting, you know, um, self-promoting yourself. The guys are okay. It's okay for the guys to do it and take credit for our work but it's not okay for us to do it. And also be sponsors for young girls that are coming up. I've done see them climbing up the ladder. That's the joy I see. That's the joy. That's why I do what I do. We need to be doing that. You know, get more involved in professional uh, associations and, and, and volunteer where you can. So, so women in STEM have one of the toughest and potentially most rewarding jobs in the world. That's what I would say. Because we, we, we face all kinds of challenges, right? Um, and especially in the male-dominated environment. The onus of improving diversity in, in STEM shouldn't solely rest on women shoulders. But it's a systematic change that might happen. And I always say, you know, um, there, there are always going to be setbacks and challenges. We need to acknowledge that we will learn from this and develop a healthy approach to resilience, perseverance, and persistence. Wow. Wow. There were so, so many, many amazing, amazing tips, tips for, for, you know, you know especially, especially young female professionals. So thank you so much for sharing your own life so authentically and presenting many examples. I'm really, really appreciative. And you've already alluded a little bit, but I'd love to hear where, you know, especially with the impact of COVID-19 in the future, where do you, you know, what would you like to see happen regarding female professionals within STEM or otherwise? Well, there need to be a reform, no question about it. We have relaxed and accepted the same nonsense for too long. And often women in leadership roles have adapted to be on pedestal or maybe a checkbox and have no influence, no changes required for the betterment or empowerment of women. 
especially policy changes need to change. This is for everybody. A research study that was done by Harvard realized that if we have more women in leadership position, the GDP will grow by a lot, by more than double. But why are we not doing it? Because we int intimidate them, right? So for the West, women are leaving the workforce in droves, especially during COVID-19. The US Bureau of Statistics says 2.2 fewer women are in the labor force in October 2020 compared to October 2029. I can personally confirm this as I have women when during the COVID have to attend to their kids, have to attend to work, and I have to show empathy and support to my staff. And some are also male during this pandemic without following any existing HR policies, not even informing HR. I let I gave them flex hours to work. As long as the work is done, that's all I care about. Is that not enough? Is that not enough? Yeah. Why are we pitching holding ourselves 8.30 to 3.30 or 4.30 uh, and 9 to 5? Why? If we give them that flexibility, they can take some time, attend to their kids. When their kids go to bed, they can come back and do the work for us. Is that not what matters? And for COVID, there are a lot of women who are not voluntarily stepping out. They are being shoved out in disproportionate job loss. Shattered school, lack of childcare, pay disparity is something I wouldn't even get in today because it's a whole different topic. Lack of public policy to support women, like I said. Our HR policy, I couldn't do it, but I was doing it. And if they want to fire me, so be it. I didn't do anything for Juanita. I did it to help other women and other males as well, right? Uh, so especially during the pandemic. So for me, policy changes needs to be. The workforce, we have to start looking at the workforce. You know, shared workforce, you know, job sharing and all that. Like most women do part-time, why? because that's what we can afford. Why are we not doing more? I know when I had my three kids in daycare, my salary, almost all my salary goes there. I was asking, why am I working? Maybe I should stay at home. But I say, you know what? I'll just give it to them, it's okay. And I do respect a lot of women who stay at home because I couldn't do it, I was selfish, sorry. Right, I couldn't, I do respect, it wasn't easy. But it is, you know, now the Trudeau government have introduced child care reform, which is great. But then, you know, you look at it, you go, well, you know, I can do both, right? So women during COVID also have seen their workload doubling, you know, trying to attend to family needs as well. So there need to be reform to address the issues why women are leaving the workforce, especially at sea level suite position. I was there, I left. And I have no desire to get back there unless this changes or I find an environment that I can adapt and make a change. You know, people are in position of power need to be at the table to ensure there are policy changes. This is not a woman's problem, as I said in my opening, anymore. It is a societal problem. Diversified workforce should be the norm where there are equal proposition for a, propor a proportion of women in leadership and all different levels of, 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 of leadership. You know, you look at companies like Cisco who have done so well, are doing very, very well. Pay disparity is also a big issue, pay equity. You know, in one of the jobs I worked, there were two women, seven men. My portfolio was three times bigger than a male one. Why? I question it, why? We are getting the same pay, the same benefits, why? Sometimes we just do it, right? We need to create pay equity and develop some strategic training programs to, to train executives about diversified workforce so that they cannot continue with their biases against, oh yeah, women are this, oh yeah, women, they don't have confidence, you know, all they know is talk, you know, they like to cause conflict, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not true. They want change. Give us the change we need for our girls and women that are coming up who are professional. They want to work. They want to work. They want to raise their kids and work. Give them that flexibility they need to raise kids and be able to work and be the mother they want to be. Yeah. However, 
you know, best thing is that it's not hopeless case yet. Several reforms can be done. We've seen that with the childcare in Canada now to fill the gap, like, you know, mentorship programming, you know, amplifying voices, which have led to the government to make that big change on childcare. So that to me, that, that was a big win. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's um, just um, you know, you I'm know, looking to think, to think what there what can, can be done, done and, and, and what, what difference it will make. Like, you know, I was thinking about what you were saying, flexible time, how you basically focused on outcome rather than, okay, it needs to be done between nine to five as long mm -hmm. as the outcome is there mm -hmm. and therefore allowing more people to still stay in the workforce who otherwise might have had to opt out because it was mm -hmm. impossible to do things maybe during the day, especially if you have younger kids. Kids, okay, exactly. And so, I mean, it's been just so wonderful to listen to you, Juanita, to all your experience, your, all your suggestions and tips and advice for especially our um, younger professionals who are viewing and listening to us. So I just wanted to make sure, is there anything else you would like to share with our audience that we have not covered yet? Well, I think we've covered, I've covered most, like some of them are much bigger topic I can address at a later time. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic, especially women in STEM. Um, and like, I love my new home, Canada. I still love my country, Ghana. Uh, based on my personal experience, uh, Canada is a nation where freedom and opportunity can be yours, regardless of who you are. For me, it was passion, resilience, perseverance, and persistence, and the willingness to learn and adapt and embrace change. So it's possible to be your authentic self. It's possible to have your voice heard. It's possible to keep moving and have a growth mindset. It's possible to turn challenges into opportunities as failures is not a permanent mindset. Rather, we learn from our mistake. It's possible to stay positive and focus on our goals and desires. It's possible to learn to challenge our own thoughts and biases and steps we need to take to make a difference in our own small way. It's possible to promise to ourselves that will keep this momentum by encouraging and emerging female professionals around us. Thank you for allowing me to add my voice to this conversation, if it's possible for us to work together. Wow, thank you so much, Juanita. And now for people who have listened to us, how can they find you, like, you know, on social media? Well, um, I didn't used to have <laughs> social media presence until um, Quiz actually got me to like, Christina's like, why? You don't have this on, on LinkedIn. You don't have this. Uh, like I said, I haven't updated my LinkedIn. When uh, sh uh, she's the president of Squeeze, you heard that I was the, I was not appointed to the board. You go, why is it not on LinkedIn? So I'm trying. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Twitter. So Juanita de Susan Hulete, hashtag you find me. Yeah, um, you know, I try to check my LinkedIn once a day <laughs> when I can. Yeah. <laughs> that that is great. So I will be sure when you know we make this um into a podcast episode in the show notes, there are all the ways to connect with you and find you mm -hmm. on social media and learn more about you and your work. And I'm again so appreciative that you took the time to talk with me and our audience today. And so I want to say, say thank you again. It has been such a wonderful experience. Thank you very much, Karen. I really enjoyed the conversation and the questions you framed for me. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm here to, to share my experience. I'm an open book. My family knows that. As I believe, the more we share, the more we learn from each other, the more we inspire each other uh, to keep moving and not be static. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.